Hi, and uh, thanks for uh, hosting me today, uh, Matt, and uh, good to talk to you, uh, Oliver. Um, for the listeners, my name is Sean Rusin. I'm the founder of the Cisco Group, uh, also the founder of Eurasia Holdings, a private equity group uh, that was the largest holder of the Cisco Mining One, which is a project that, that we bought the Canadian Malark assets in northern Quebec uh, for $88,888 and built it into the largest gold mine in Canada, the ninth largest gold mine in the world. Um, and that mine was sold after a hostile uh, pro production with uh, Gold Corp to uh, Yamana and Agnico. Uh, subsequently, uh, Agnico has bought that. We sold that mine for $4.1 billion Canadian in the end. Uh, I also went on to create the Cisco Gold Royalties platform. We IPO'd that two days after we sold that at about a $500 million uh, market cap on the NYSC. It now trades about $4.1 billion on the NYSC. So that was our second a four billion dollar company, uh, and today I'm dedicated to the evolution of the Cisco development. Which uh, our two primary assets is a large gold deposit in central British Columbia called Caribou Gold, uh, as well as a property in uh, the Utah called Tintic, uh, which was previously operative by Ken Kennecott and then Rio. Uh, and what we're doing there is we're hunting a Bingham style porphyry uh, that uh, we think could be one of the next big copper gold underground projects. Uh, we've also formed several other companies like Cisco Mining, which has uh, about a billion two market cap. Uh, things like Falco Resources, and uh, we have 17 public companies that have been spawned out of the Cisco deal. Um, our big belief system right now is copper and gold. Um, I think you could know, reverse the order uh, depending on what's going on. I think the thing that's got me the most excited. I'm, I've, you know, I've stepped off my my royalty duties after I've been the CEO and chairman there for 10 years. Um, and I've uh, taken on ODV because we have both the copper projects uh, as well as the gold projects on the go uh, in safe jurisdictions. So that's our, our belief system. And then, you know, I'm interested to, to hear uh, Oliver's story. Uh, he and Paul have done a fantastic job and, uh, on Cora. And, uh, you know, this, this these are big success stories. And, um, and for, you know, the experience in this industry is re, re Repeat success is more the uh, the way things go. Uh, people that figure out how to do this business and have the tenacity to stick to it are often successful in multiple assets. And you know, certainly, I think that's one of our big themes: is keep our group together and focus on like minded individuals and work alongside groups uh, like Paul and Oliver. Uh, you know that that have done that as well because it, uh, there is a formula to it, and to make shareholders money. I think the big opportunity today for shareholders is we're not waiting for the gold price. Uh, the gold price is here. Uh, we're waiting for the equity markets to catch up with it. So, you know, my excitement on this is that I don't have to worry about the gold price to go up. It's already gone up. The question is, when are we going to see the equities respond to it, which I think is a far easier problem to solve than waiting for gold price to fix the market. Um, you know, and as we see geopolitical risk around the world uh, with what happened in Panama, uh, with shareholders getting zero out of Ro Rosa Montana, uh, with all the political unrisk, you know, Wagner threatening to take mines away from Barrick and Mallet. <clears throat> the, uh, the safe jurisdiction assets have gone up in value significantly. Uh, certainly, we've seen an increase in traffic across our, our portfolio uh, with all the projects that we're involved in uh, in the past. Um, and, you know, so that's one of our themes that we think that shareholders will be rewarded uh, for the jurisdictional uh, premium that we we have and, and as, as, as does a Oliver with his portfolio, you know, so that's really our theme. And the Cisco group is, uh, you know, we're Brownfield specialists. We'd like to go into these old mining camps, unwind the, the science and uh, drive value for shareholders. So I'll pass it over to you, uh, Matt or Oliver. Yeah, thanks, uh, Sean, and, and a great introduction and uh, and certainly some phenomenal work having been done there uh, by the Cisco group over years. And, and we, you know, we're trying to emulate that kind of success over here with with Core and the ball and, and uh, various projects we put together over the last uh, 10, 15 years. Uh, same same kind of motto, uh, you know, great people, great jurisdictions, really good projects, often uh, basically unlocking value that other groups don't see in these projects, sometimes troubled, struggling assets. We all know the core story. We'll be walking through that today a little bit for sure. Uh, but unlocking that value, uh, making shareholders money, uh, you know, moving on to the next project and repeating that kind of success. So 
a little bit about myself. I, you know, long career in, in the mining industry and with respect to a technical background, seven years as, a, as an equity research analyst. So I echo your sentiments there, Sean, in terms of, uh, you know, where we've arrived at this wonderful year we've probably been talking to, about for the last 15 plus years uh, when it comes to the gold price. Uh, and, and we, you know, the equities haven't responded the way they should yet, but of course they will once some of these financials start to throw through, flow through to the broader markets uh, optics. And then, uh, you know, after that, obviously jumping on board with Paula Core, then RNC Minerals, a a single asset producer with no mill, uh, burdened by royalties, a uh, nickel asset in Canada, and we've scaled that into a multi-mill, multi-mine, unlocked royalty story uh, and expanded it to well over a billion dollar market cap company that's going to be producing about 200,000 ounces a year. And then, of course, as all the viewers here know, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, we announced a, a tran- you know transformational merger with West Gold Resources in Australia to create the third largest gold producer. And I will say this a couple times on this call, especially in the gold price environment that we live in, the largest 100% unhedged Australian gold producer in existence. Uh, and that's going to be a fantastic company starting at the gate of $2.5 billion, producing over 450,000 ounces a year. And uh, will occupy a very much vacant space on the ASX. It'll be dual listed. Uh, but you know, no matter which way you slice it on a valuation basis, we expect that thing to re-rate meaningfully, both from scale, from index demand, from the free cash flow that this thing is going to be checking off at you know twenty three hundred, twenty four hundred dollar US gold. Extremely excited about it. Uh, and of course, you know, as you mentioned, Sean, you know, creating new businesses is what we like to do. We've also created a spin co out of this business, uh, which will be you know uh, our next sort of project here, and looking at what we might might want to be tucking into that. A uh, little spin co that's going to be well cashed up with some great lithium interests. We also earlier this year launched a, uh, a brand new lithium vehicle in Australia, which is a bit anomalous when it comes to the global lithium market. Uh, the West Rock hard, uh, Western Australia hard rock uh, market is certainly a little bit more powerful than the rest. That was the hottest lithium IPO on the ASX in quite some time. So that, that's going quite well. It's of course called Cali Metals. But lots of projects going on. Uh, but when you put good people and good teams together, you want to keep them together, repeat that success. And something that we aim to do as well. Right. Brilliant. Okay. So great introduction from from, from uh, two guys, that, um, I, I guess. You've built big companies, okay? Building big companies is one thing, and building uh, wealth uh, for investors, I, I guess, doesn't necessarily always correlate. So I'm looking at this market, high, high gold price environment. Um, you think producers should be taking advantage, advantage of it. Some of them are, but as Sean points out, maybe the equities haven't quite reacted. So I'm looking to you guys to talk to us investors today about some of the variables that you guys look at to engineer that success because sitting back and hoping the market does the heavy lifting for you probably isn't like, isn't good science so in terms of financing options do you guys what's worked what hasn't m a recruitment de-risking generally and what signals do you look for so sean if i can start with you not all money's built and designed the same way so when you're developing a company like like you have done many many times how do you look at the financing op- op- options available to you in a high price gold environment? Yeah, thanks for the question, Matt. I guess I would start off with the fact that uh, nobody ever won the Kentucky Derby with a donkey. Um, so it starts with the quality of your project. Uh, if you don't have a good asset, the cost of capital is not going to be there for you. Um, so I think mostly in what the generation uh, of, of investors have to earn on their side for their shareholders. You know, what are the returns going to be? You know, if you look at private equity, it's it's mid-teens, so, you know, sort of 14 to 18% is kind of their hurdle rate. Um, if you look at the bank rates right now, it's they're extremely sensitive when it comes to downside risk. Um, you know, so you've got to take into account what you're going to give up, and it comes down to security and covenants when it comes to anything to do with converts or, or debt. Um, the royalty business is one I know well. I built the fourth largest royalty company in the world. Uh, under OR, um, the royalty business is you know provides a lower cost of capital in a lot of ways because royalty companies tend to trade at a premium and their cost of capital pass through, you know they trade anywhere from a low of one point one to you know up to two and a half times NAV, so their real cost of capital is quite a bit lower than the rest of the market. Uh, money from corporates is usually at the asset level um, that it comes in, so they want a joint venture or they want to earn into the project or they want to just buy the project. So those are, you know, sort of the main silos that we have to work with. Uh, And, you know, I try to be a little bit, you know, sort of omnivore in terms of trying to come up with a project package where I can get as much optionality on putting that debt out or taking it back 
and keeping the asset level dilution as minimal as possible. Um, and then, you know, in terms of, you know, equity, the advantage of equity is that it doesn't hang over the project with the debt. Um, so if you can be opportunistic in an uptick market uh, and get the right ratio, sort of, I would say that, you know, the proper ratio to strive for is maybe a 50-50, but what's going on out there right now is probably more like a 20-80, 20, 20 equity, 80% convert or debt and no royalty or offtake. Uh, you know, the other leg of the stool is the offtake agreements. Um, if you have a, a, a very high quality concentrate right now um, with what's happened in Panama uh, and what's happening around the world and with Saudi Arabia entering in in a big way uh, to the concentrate and smelting business, the competition to get offtake agreements has really stepped up. Uh, stuff that you might have sold for 10 bucks, you know, five years ago is probably worth 100 bucks now uh, in terms of people getting offtakes. And, you know, the, at the end of the day, mining is an energy equation. So you've got energy rich countries like Saudi Arabia are taking advantage that they can produce electricity with solar and, and gas at like one cent a kilowatt. Canada should take advantage of that. We have very low cost hydroelectric power, very clean power. Um, and that's when, when the, one of the reasons that we get low cost of capital. Uh, for example, at Caribou Gold and our BC project is where you're getting 6.6 .6 cents Canadian a kilowatt hour and it's all clean power from from BC Hydro, we don't have any diesel uh, generated power in that project. Uh, so those are things that can lower your cost of capital. ESG is a big part of the scoring now. Uh, so being on top of your ESG and being able to uh, to make sure that your carbon footprint is relatively low will affect the cost of capital on an overall basis and also affects the audience that you have for equity. Um, a lot of the big pension funds right now are pretty ESG sensitive. Uh, and if you're not scoring in the sort of the the top four trial um, on the ESG front, uh, your cost of capital is quite different. Uh, so those are kind of the ways that I think about it. And, you know, I think that the 50, 50 kind of approach um, is where I would come down in terms of trying to achieve it. Uh, when we built Canadian Malartic. We had a town to move. I had to move 205 houses and six institutional buildings. Uh, we were not able to achieve, achieve much traditional debt there. So that was a you know, significantly higher ratio. We were almost eighty percent equity on that one. Okay, and if, if I just ask you one more thing, Sean, the the, the end of the the question I asked, which is, it, it's when you when do you sort of you know suck suck after in your teeth when you sort of look at the way that some companies do this? Where does it go wrong? You know, I I come from a sort of you know structured finance background and and banking, and some of the companies we saw taking things like convertibles, you know, such so, so far away from any kind of revenue structure. Only because it was the like the last option available to them, that makes me run a mile. I mean, when you when you look out there in the market, I mean, do you see, you know, it's slightly desperate times, right? Finance and money has been hard to come by for the last three years. I mean, do, what are the things that you look at and go, well, that's that's a red flag for me? Yeah, I think it's a it, it's really what the use of proceeds come down to. If you have a major milestone that you're achieving with that convertible and you have a way out of it, um, it can be a bridge. Uh, we certainly used it, you know, in the case of like Victoria Gold and some of the other things. Uh, we knew we were like, you know, 19 months from from gold pour and we had a layoff process to buy that convert. It also depends very much on the covenants of the convert and your buyback ability. Um, so, you know, I think that there, there are, you know, there's a there's a 10% of the converts are, are manageable. And then there's the 90% that talk that you talk about that are they're quite difficult to, to get around on the balance sheet. Um you know, the equity markets haven't been performing that well. Um, you know, we've got a lot of entrance into the the finance space with the royalty and streaming companies providing, you know, a lower cost of, of permanent capital um, that, you know, doesn't have to be paid back. Uh, so a lot of that has gone on, and I've certainly been, you know, part of that story. And then, you know, you look at the private equity groups, um, you know, they've they've been pretty dominant in project financing for the last five to 10 years, especially on bigger development stories as the sort of bridge to that before the banks are, are willing to actually take on the traditional debt. Uh, and then, you know, these equity markets, you know, they're, they're always operate on a window basis. You get small windows where the equity market is, is open. And we use the, we always use the analogy of the cookie jar. Um, you know, it, for those of us in the business, we're pretty good at hearing the cookie jar open. Uh, <laughs> And even if you think you did, you you go and find out if, the cookie, if there are any cookies in the cookie jar. And, you know, as I like to say, the uh, the successful entrepreneur 
uh, will not take a cookie from the cookie jar. He may take a, take a cookie out, hand it to the guy that's holding. And while the guy that's holding is confused, grabs the cookie jar and runs. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, to, I mean, to, to, to layer a couple of points on onto what Sean just said there, I like the cookie jar analogy. As I do like the donkey analogy, I'll circle back on that one. But the uh, the, the cookie jar analogy there, I mean, one of the first examples of that, and we'll talk about the current uh, financing environment in a second here, Matt, but when we financed uh, the acquisition of the Lakewood Mill, obviously the use of proceeds for that, um, you know, a couple of years ago was exactly what every, you know, every investor was worried about. We were seeing, you know, CapEx blowing out uh, through the roof with every project, uh, you know, huge issues with cost overruns and de-risking was the name of the game a, a couple of years ago. And so we managed to hit a window and trust me, we did not assist, you know, we didn't time the market. Uh, the market came to us where that cookie jar did open up for a few days. We did, uh, you know, originally a $50 million bot deal that got upsized to over 69 million with the green shoes. So we hit that, hit that window properly. And we've only done two financings in the entire history of Aurora. We did 18 million right when we came in to shore up the balance sheet. The company had $600,000 in cash, couldn't make payroll, negative $8 million in working capital right when we walked through the door. It was certainly was a different story today, obviously. And then the, and the second uh, financing that we did do uh, was the, uh, the acquisition of Lakewood Mill. But to, to bring it forward through to today, you know, we talk about the environment, some of the financings that you're seeing going off, we're not seeing that much new issue. And, and for your investor or your viewers, new issue is issuance of new stock, you know, in large amounts coming out. We're seeing some happen, but not as much as you'd expect given the gold price environment. And, and to Sean's point, that's because a lot of the equities haven't responded to the levels that they should yet. And there's this kind of once bitten, twice shy mentality here in the resource sector amongst generalists that left the sector and haven't come back. But one of the things I would say for some of these projects, you know, fortunately, neither of us are involved with those. And obviously, we're in a different bracket being a producer that's generating cash. But uh, to use the donkey analogy, there's still a lot of projects out there that are technically struggling or they're, they're struggling with labor cost inputs. They, the, the, the projects have not been repaired by the metal price and the metal price will help as margins start to expand or let's just say as some of them even just start to turn into making money rather than just continuously losing money. And some of these small financings you see go off with, you know, with a full you know, five-year warrant uh, on it. Those are financings of last resort. They're being hit by, um, you know, let's just say, investors that are short-term in nature. Uh, typically, hedge funds are the, are the groups that are behind that. None of the groups that Sean talked about before are the ones that are doing those kind of financings. So you're seeing them go off. Yes, they're pinch your nose and and hope for the best. But these companies really don't have any alternatives. Either this, uh, th these kind of financing goes off, or the projects basically go into receivership. So that's one end of the spectrum. The other end of the spectrum, uh, we are starting to see uh, some, you know, bigger groups uh, circle around some of these projects, particularly in the base metal space. Um, the new pools of capital, Sean touched on Saudi. I personally am is extremely encouraged about what's happening over there uh, in terms of their project level interest. Look, if you can if you can give them a good concentrate, as as Sean mentioned, uh, that, that allows them to justify on onshore uh, concentration capacity that'll build jobs in Saudi Arabia, they're starting to become very interested in, in foreign projects and becoming more uh, comfortable with project level risk, which of course isn't in their, their expertise wheelhouse. So we're seeing those pools of capital open up as the traditional pools of capital here in North America have, have dried up. There's there's an incredible chart that, that circulated a couple of months ago um, I, on Twitter, but a whole bunch of different mediums that was basically talking about the shrink in active uh, capital and uh, or active assets under management here in the mining sector, right? We, we've gone from well north of 40 down to 11 uh, in, 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 terms of active, in terms of billions of dollars of actively managed capital in the North American and European sector. So it is a, a vastly shrunk pool. Guys are recycling, and uh, by that I mean fund managers are recycling capital in order for me to finance Sean's project. I need to sell Matt's project. That's the way that guys are having to think while facing redemption. So I think as we get start to get a, a few quarters under our belt here, and with these metal prices, and we can talk about where we think gold prices and some metal prices are going, because I think it's an extremely interesting conversation to have. As you start to notch some quarters of true free cash generation, look, there, some of these producers, ourselves included, are generating fantastic margins at, at these prices. And I think as that starts to, you know, that, that cash is harvested, put on the balance sheet, and of course, some of it returns to shareholders, which is crucially important, you'll start to see the bigger guys start to pay attention. Uh, and those more friendly, lower cost of capital, all cognizant of the fact of the interest rate environment we currently live in, lower cost uh, of capital pools will come back to the sector and we, you know, we should be off to the races. But in the meantime, it's kind of, um, you know, the cookie jar analogy is great. Uh, you know, being an entrepreneur, finding the best source of capital for your project that's going to allow you to move it forward. Because if you don't have capital, you can't move a lot of these projects forward and investors aren't going to see those returns and they'll move on elsewhere. Yeah, I mean, I, I was there from 2019 when, you know, you were going through those difficult days um, at Corora, but 
when you went to raise the 18 million, you were getting all sorts of advice about diluting, uh, you know, sh- retail shareholders predominantly, um, and it was it was a case of I think you were back then saying, look, it's it's a case of um, you've got to take the money when it's there because it may not always be there, and and I think that proved that to be right in, in your case. Um, but just st- sticking with the donkey thing, um, we, so we, you've got to you've got to you've got to have a you've got to have a kind of thoroughbred horse uh, with which to allocate your capital, or else it's. Uh, probably not going to work out no matter how much money you've got. So M and A, that's a kind of another kind of cornerstone in this environment. We've seen uh, a BHP and Anglo uh, there. We obviously you, you guys recently, um, Carora uh, and West Gold as well. We're seeing a lot of M and A of a different type. You know, in the past couple of months compared to last year, where it was a merger of equal, equally desperate. That is. And perhaps that was a bit obvious for people to see. So, do you, what's what's your view, Sean, on M and A as as a tool for uh, growth, meaningful growth uh, for you uh, in an environment like this? Well, I think size matters when it comes to uh, to the market access. Um, you know, the kind of the magic number out there is a billion dollars US if you want to, you know, have enough liquidity and enough volume where a pension fund can be below 5% uh, and, and achieve the liquidity that they need to do. So if you're not a billion dollar market cap, you got to think about how you get there. Um, you know, it's one of the challenges I took on with ODB is to you know, set that G destination GPS. I mean, we've 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 done it uh, five times. Uh, take companies from almost a you know negligible market cap over the billion dollar line. Um, most recently, we did Windfall Lake. We that was a roll up, so that was built off the back of M and A. We consolidated seven public companies. Um, Windfall was the winner. Uh, we drilled two point two million meters into that, and subsequently we did a deal with Goldfields, and now the company is one point two billion dollar market cap with. Four hundred and fifty million in cash in it, and another three hundred million dollars due on the permit from Goldfields. Um, so you know that's that's an interesting deal to look at in terms of structure because there was an arb there on flow through. Um, John used mostly flow through to dry that off. That he raised at about a eighty percent premium to market. For those of you not familiar with flow through, it's a tax tax advantage in Canada, which is essentially an R and D credit that we use in exploration in Canada. And then he was able to get hard dollars back. Uh, from the Australians for those so-called flow-through dollars. So his real cost of capital was about half of, of that. So it was about 60 cents on the dollar uh, by the time he did that deal. Um, so we play in this game, in this market, but it's a sophisticated finance platform to do, and it's only specific to Canada where you have access to flow-through. And there is some of that stuff in Australia, but a much smaller scale. Um, so there are those sort of hybrid structures that we're familiar with, and we ended up being you know, fifty percent of the drill count in Canada for five years in a row. Um, so we've we've done about seventeen M and A's from the Cisco platform, um, and roll up plays to get to critical mass in a property is is often how we get to where we are. Caribou is a classic example. We have two thousand square kilometer land packages there, um, which is one of the biggest. It's the same size as the entire Valdor camp. Um, it's eighty three kilometers long, which is the same strike length as as a. Uh, yeah, as as some of the biggest mine, mining camps in the world. So I always believe that you have to get in, you have to achieve a dominant land package. Um, you have to make sure that you control the, you know, your access to surface rights and all those things. And then you know, now you've sort of set the stage to be in that billion dollar club. Uh, and you have to have a, a property of scale that eventually is going to interest a major or has the stage to get you into the, the 500 club, as I call it, the 500,000 ounces a year. Uh, club because you know if you look at the mark cap uh, mineral I mean Alamo is a good example of the 500 club um, I think they're predicting 490 thousand ounces this year they got an 8.2 billion dollar mark cap um, so that you know you cross over into the into the zone where you're where you're investable versus not investable uh, with the big tier like BlackRock and Vanek and all the rest and they can't own the smaller names due to the liquidity constraints and concentration issues. So those are the dynamics that drive it. And back to the Kentucky Derby analysis, um, you need a good jockey uh, on that. A fast horse is not enough. Uh, and no good jockey is ever going to show up with a with a bad horse. I mean, the reason that they're a good jockey is because they're pretty good at horse selection. You know, so that combination of the jockey and the horse uh, and being able to manage all the things that are going to happen during the race um, is also the key thing if you're looking to invest right now. I think you have to look at track records. Um, and if you don't, if it's a you know first time CEO, first time management group, 
um, you know, you better do the, the homework and find out who they are and, and, and what their, what their achievements in life are. Um, you know, one of the things we always get accused of in this space is that there's too much capital destruction. But when we look around at it, you know, money tends to end up in a lot of, a lot of companies that perhaps that they shouldn't be in. So I don't want to talk down my, my brothers in the business, uh, because, you know, I, I came from humble backgrounds and this business was very good to me and I didn't have a track record when I started. So, you know, so that's, that's the other challenge that you have here is making sure that the jockey is right. Uh, and, you know, in terms of being able to tough it out, that jockey has to be capable of, of uh, raising capital and then holding hands with the shareholders in the rainy days uh, and getting you through this. And in terms of M and A, if you're going to be serious in this business, that's how you're going to build critical mass. You know, there's the 90% of the discoveries right now, 99% of the discoveries right now are on Brownfield. And if you're going to go into a Brownfield camp, there's other people there already. Uh, so you better figure out your M and A strategy and, and sharpen your toolbox. Uh, but it's, you know, all the companies like, you know, you look what, what Carora did, what we've done on a lot of the other successful companies, it's all built off of M and A in the beginning. I got Canadian Malartic for 80,800 bucks out of, out of bankruptcy and Barrick had sold it in 2003 for a dollar. Um, but I ended up doing 22 more deals to consolidate that land package, which is now hosting 33 million ounces. Right. And Oliver, for you, obviously you've gone through that merger recently with, with Westgold. You chose to do that. And I think some were questioning the need to do that. You had, you know, you kind of um, built kind of critical mass of your own. You're moving into, you know, a seminal year in 2025 in terms of um, some of the assets that you're going to, I guess, liberate answers from. Um, why did it make sense for you to do that now in a high price gold environment? Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's a good question and, and something that, you know, we're extremely excited about. Look, there, there, there are certainly weight classes in this industry that matter. And, and to Sean's point there, when you talk about the 500 club, that's exactly where we're heading with this pro forma entity. Um, not only that, and I said it once before, but I'll say it again, we will be the third largest and, and the only 100% unhedged Australian gold producer. The Australian uh, entities, you know, or the Australian mining companies enjoy a multiple premium compared to where we're trading in Canada. So you're capturing a multiple premium you're cap- uh, in terms of the ASX. You're capturing a multiple premium. By the way, that's a um, evaluation based on your NAV. So we trade it at price to NAV multiples. For those of you listening, uh, we would expect to be well north of one. Once this entity gets consolidated, we're trading around 0.6 to 0.7 right now. Um, so you'll be into a, a larger entity. You'll be on the ASX. You have incredible index demand. Uh, so we expect about 30 million, 30 million shares of demand to be into the ASX 200, which is their second largest index there. About 20 million of shares of demand to be uh, graduate onto the GDX, uh, which is all the passive fund flows. A lot of the, ma- the money managers that, that Sean was talking about, you know, the Black Rocks of the world, the Van X of the world, these guys need scale in order to be able to invest. A lot of the pension funds do. So we get bigger and more investable. So you have passive uh, basically a tailwind, so let's call it. So all of the right financial metrics are working in your favor. But let's talk about the assets, right? Because ultimately in this business, when you're doing M&A at this scale, what you need to unlock are true synergies. And we're not talking about just corporate synergies where you know, you're eliminating one management team and, and that's you know, all the way you go, but true synergies from, at the operational level. How do you make these operations better together rather than on their own? And then the second thing I'll talk about is how do you accelerate projects? And with West Gold, we get all of this in one package. So when it comes to synergies, Look, there is an incredible amount, and if, for those of you that understand the West Gold history, um, you know it was it was a a, a larger entity than it is today, producing over three hundred thousand ounces a year. Wayne came in a couple of years ago. That's the CEO. Of West Gold has done a phenomenal job in rationalizing the business, the assets that actually make money, focusing on free cash flow generation rather than mining for for ounces' sake. As part of that, they rolled up their uh, contracting business, which had uh, you know well over a hundred pieces of equipment. That piece, those pieces of equipment are being used as their assets, but a lot of them are sitting idle on their sites right now. And this is excellent equipment that can be used across the portfolio. Enter Beta Hunt and Higginsville and the assets that we have. Look, everybody knows how well Beta Hunt's been going, and a lot of investors are very excited for 2025, as are we. But we also have other assets, whether it's Mount Henry to the south, whether it's Spargo's Underground, and I'll talk about that M&A just as a little tuck-in, which turned into be a lot more than a tuck-in uh, several years ago. Uh, those are projects that we now have the capability of accelerating, things that would take 12, 18, 24 months to get underway, additional capital that we need to wait for until we finished expanding Beta Hunt. We get to accelerate those projects. Now, acceleration is always a good thing. But accelerating a project into $2,400 US, a gold environment, is a very good thing in terms of bringing those cash flows forward. 
we could not do that on our own. So that's a true synergy with our project that is is unavailable uh, with any other uh, merger that we would do. So that's that's a that's a true synergy that we have. We also have obviously the ability to share uh, consumables across five mills that are in the Western Australian region and consolidate the entire team in Western Australia. Then this the second aspect that you know is definitely worthwhile talking about is is I'm um, sorry the, the the second sort of equipment synergy that's worthwhile talking about is drilling. They have a lot of drills that they can bring down to accelerate um, Higginsville. So Sean mentioned one of the biggest things that matters for building scale of this kind of relevance is having a dominant land position. Corora owns the single largest land package in Western Australia and the Kalgoorlie Belt. It's almost 2,000 square kilometers. We worked via m and in the early days uh, in order to consolidate that land package and bring it under one ownership. We now have the capability with West Gold's resources, the combined cash of the company, to accelerate, accelerate exploration across that entire property. That is truly a game changer for the entire entity. So that is that is really, really important to consider. Um, so at the operational level, we're doing a lot of great things. At the financial level, we expect the stock to re-rate. None of this is available if Corora kind of goes it alone. And we also don't have access to those Australian capital markets if we just remain TSX listed. So a lot of reasons why now makes sense. And one of the things I will say here, this is you know very important to reiterate, this is not a sale to business. This is a merger, and we now own 49.9% as Corora shareholders of the third largest 100% on hedge Australian gold producer. That is going to be a fun ride to be part of, and then also going to become shareholders of this spin code. The cash component of this deal, which is required for that, that, that you see that split on ownership, is a very small component of this deal. Um, the majority of it's going to be in paper, and we're going to be very, very happy shareholders once this deal closes. Right. Okay. So you're talking, you're talking about re-rates because you're going to get obviously access to indices, re-rate uh, in terms of efficiencies, in terms of access, uh, access to additional equipment, et cetera. And you'll be able to get after some projects which you haven't been able to uh, or would be able to on your on your own steam. So hopefully that comes. That's where you got to kind of prove because I think the we make money when the share price increases, not when you get bigger. So that's what we'd look forward to you. For, for, for you, and um, Sean, one, as one, well. One thing, one other thing there, mm-hmm. Matt, which is which is worth talking about. So, you know, to talk about this, uh, the horse and jockey kind of analogy there as well, you take a step back in terms of where Corora started, you know, up, up to the, the numbers that we just printed when we did this deal. You know, that's a 747% return. Uh, Paul and the team prior at Klondex, you know, printed a plus 800% return for shareholders. So to, to Sean's point about teams, I've done this multiple times and the Assisco group's done it innumerable times. Um, you know, it's horse and jockey. And when we first entered, uh, you know, at Corora, and, and you'll remember this, Matt, because you were there in the early days. People took, you know, a big groan, a big sigh. Oh, Beta Hunt, that's a legacy asset with a lot of issues. Oh, Higginsville, that's, an, you know, that's something that the prior company couldn't make work. What are you guys doing? As management teams and as jockeys of these horses that we select, yeah, you know, we think in terms of three, five, seven year long strategies. We look at the asset base. We realize there's a whole bunch of hair on it in the current environment that we live in today. There's lots of projects out there, but none of them are without hair on it. But once you have the technical capabilities and let's just call it the, the capital markets capabilities and the financial capabilities to unlock value from these things, it doesn't happen overnight, but it does take years. And that's happened with Fire Creek at Klondex and the assets that were rolled in there. Same thing at Corora Resources. So pay attention to that. See where Sean and his team go next, what they do next. They see where we go next, what we do next. And back those teams and trust that the assets that they're looking at, that in, upon initial review, you might go, that's a bit of a head of scratcher. Why are they looking at that thing? We have long-term strategies and we see uh, the capability of unlocking value that perhaps other jockeys and teams could not. Right. Okay. But um, I hear what you're saying. Um, and I, I agree with a lot of what you're saying. Um, but Sean, I'll put it over to you. The same statement that, you know, we investors make money when the share price goes up. Um, it's been a tough three years for precious metals uh, across the board. Um, and the equities have not responded. People have not been, you know, it's risk off environment. What tools have you got available um, to you and your various projects and companies to be able to kind of look forward to the next three years and say, well, actually, this is the environment where we start to get that share price moving, not just a case of scale, but scale and profit and dividends and all of those good things investors look forward to. Yeah, I mean, this is a, you know, it's a tough business and, uh, you know, requires that you, you have some optimistic tendencies. And, uh, you know, my description of, of the way that we work in this world is, you know, you have the optimist, the pessimist, with the optimist being half full glass guy, the pessimist half empty. Um, to be a good uh, a good steward of, of mining assets, uh, you know, you have to look at the same scenario and realize that, uh, you know, we're only at 50% capacity and we have 100% upside. 
um, which is kind of my approach to this, is that you have to have a rainy day strategy. Um, you know, my strategy in, in bad markets is to focus on M&A um, and try and get discounted assets. Uh, when the sun is shining, you know, we, we try to advance these assets and take less dilution uh, in the overall basis than what we're delivering in terms of a value increase and to achieve, you know, the 800% returns. Um, that is the key is when you take dilution uh, and when you stand down or when do you go out and acquire an asset that's you know, somewhat troubled. Almost all the successes that we've seen recently have come out of the brownfield stuff. I mean, you know, if you look at something like Fosterville, how many people owned that before Eric got it? You know, I gave him, I bought him out of Canadian Mar or of a Caribou for $85 million. He took my 85 million bucks and went and did Fosterville, uh, which I think was nine bankruptcies in a row. And then he ends up with the highest grade mine in the world out of it and creates Kirk and Lake Gold. Um, you know, so these, these kind of plays, um, are built in the, in, in bad weather. Um, and that's usually when you want to be in these things. If you get, you know, if you get a stock that's down 70, 80%, but, you know, the guys on the on the team have the access to capital to carry on. Um, the ultimate form of dilution is always bankruptcy. Um, but anything short of bankruptcy is to live and fight another day. And, you know, the way that we approach this thing is like we always have a top 10 list of things we want to own. We've done the work and we're laying in wait. Uh, and if we get the opportunity to take it, we will. Uh, Utah is a good, good uh, example of that for us. Uh, we did the work in 2009 and 10 with Dick Silito, and we identified everything we thought that was going to be important uh, in the next generation of copper mines, i.e. anything that was at depth that was going to be block cave or bulk mining with, you know, copper porphyry systems are rather large uh, and easy to find if they outcrop the surface. And just about every outcrop on the planet has been visited by some geologist uh, at this point in time. So, you know, the... The easy pickings are, are are basically done. So the generation of wealth creation now comes from from blind targets uh, or brownfield mining camps where you have a huge amount of data uh, and the data has not been processed properly. Um, so that's that's where you have to find that time. And you know the people that sit on their hands and fret during a downtick market as opposed to look for the next asset base, uh, they don't stick around. Um, you know the guys that have been in the business a long time, like you know Oliver and. Uh, and Paul and our group and everything, you know, we've been at this our whole lives. I mean, I started as an underground miner at 18. I was a diamond driller for a long year at 21. Um, you know, so we, we're we we're dedicated to this. And if you don't have that level of intensity and concentration, um, the down the downtick markets like this are not going to help you. When I look at where where the where the leverage points are in this market right now, you know, you got Barrick sitting there at 2350 right now with a $600 increase in gold. You know, that's a cap on big money coming down market. Um, so, you know, if Barrett can move out of the way, we've seen Agnico move. Um, the big companies start reporting good results. Um, the equity markets will move down and go back, you know, take their profits and redeploy uh, down market. And that's that's the next step to come here uh, as we get further into it. And I think that's the opportunity for shareholders right now is that the equity run has not started. So, you know, it's not too late. You need to think about it. A lot of people are looking at the gold price and say, oh, I'm too late. Well, then now it's it's just starting really like, you know, you, you still got lots of opportunity to buy stuff that has our ability to double or triple. OK, so you say what, what I'm hearing there is because I'm, I'm trying to get to the point where investors feel so comfortable, you know, saying, right, OK, the name of the game is to stay in the game in the downtick, uh, be a contrarian investor, pick up good assets from perhaps others can't um, and still be sort of managing those kind of th through that that downtick in the hope that what someone else will, either you will be able to find the right cost of capital to develop it yourselves, or someone's going to come along and, and acquire that. Is that the kind of, the, the way that you view the market? I think the uh, opportunity so. for shareholders right now is you can buy quality, like tier one quality companies right now for a discount of you know 50 to 70%. Um, you're not going to get that opportunity once the market turns. And as we all know, that turn is often not very long. It can be a matter of weeks. Um, you know, and there's a couple of canaries in the mine shaft when you look around. Uh, you know, you see the GDX starting to to gain momentum. You you see deal finance financing deals start to deploy where smart money is deploying through, you know, private investments and, and public investments and, and financings are getting done. Um, M&A deals like what, uh, what Paul and Oliver have done 
Star Trek could concentrate it. You know, you saw a bunch of them recently. Agnico with, uh, or sorry, uh, Alamos with uh, Magino at Argonaut. Uh, we saw uh, Equinox, Ross B, one of the smartest guys in the business, just pulled in the 40% of Greenstone they didn't have. Um, you know, so there's, there you're starting to see the smart guys do deals. And the senior, you know, the gray hair, the, the, the silver backs of the industry are moving. Um, so if you keep an eye on those guys, uh, then, you know, you're going to you're gonna see a trend and a pattern. And I think, you know, with guys like yourself, Matt, um, you guys are doing a good job of highlighting that to, to shareholders. I don't think shareholders have to do all their own work. Um, but, you know, it's, 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 it's up to them to make sure that they're following the right people. Uh, and that you know they're paying attention to the real markers. Well, it kind of answers my next question, which is really about what what, what market signals do you look for? You took about your cookie jar opening earlier, and obviously then you kind of signaled when the silver buys kind of get moving. That it's a, it's a sign because they they tend to move sooner than even the brokers. That's a signal I look for when the brokers start asking me for copper deals or lithium deals from a couple of years ago. You you know something's coming down the line, but th- that's them following some of the signals which you look for as well. Is it? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, there's that old adage that you know Wall Street's the only place where a guy drives get, gets his driver to drive him into town in a Rolls Royce and sits down all day and takes advice from guys that came in on the train. Um, you know, so that's uh, you know that's that's a little bit what goes on here. Um, you know, you've got a bunch of people that are kind of part of the biosphere. Um, but you actually have to look at the doers, um, as opposed, you know, to the, uh, to the audience. Um, and then, uh, you know, in terms of markers, I think when we see, you know, the, the top 10 companies moving, uh, and sort of coming down right now, I would say like, you know, uh, Ag- Agnico has got the Cinderella status, um, and they've got the golden hell and, you know, that's basically on the quality of, of jurisdiction, uh, as well as the fact that they're good miners. And, you know, we've seen Barrick struggle. They got a lot of, uh, you know, exotic destinations in the portfolio. And um, they really haven't been able to get the share price. 2019, that stock was trading $41. Now it's twenty three fifty, I think, or whatever it was today. Um, we need that one to move. We need a couple of these other things that are kind of like, I would say, at the bottom of Tier 1. Uh, now, I mean, it's, um, and Nico's got a market cap $5 billion larger than Barrick now. I never thought I'd see that. Uh, but that's the reality. But, you know, you get the the argument that says, well, I can go and buy Barrick at 0. 0.65, 0. 0.7 times NAV. Um, why do I need to take the risk? And, you know, it's a valid argument. But as these things, you know, start to turn a couple quarters of profit to Oliver's point, um, you know, that that unleashes the beast here. So how to time it? It's uh, it, it's one of those things. If you, if you develop a strong belief, you can put your bet down and you'll be right. Um, if you try to get too smart, you may miss it. And, you know, that's happened a lot. Uh, we've ser- certainly seen, like, in the lithium and and uh and and critical minerals stage you know um you know we had a lot the the patriot discovery corvette in in quebec used to be one of our projects uh we still kept the royalty on it but we did make the mistake of selling it (laughs) um and we have a bunch of other things through brunswick which i think we have 520 lithium targets within odv we have a electric electric elements uh that owns a lot of the greenstone belt that we had uh, we acquired through the acquisition of virginia back in the day so I think we have 1,800 square kilometers of greenstone belts and about 26 pegmatites, that sort of thing. Um, you know, so those are call on lithium. And, you know, the lithium space has been fickle. Uh, lithium is down 82% from its peak. Um, the nickel space is is, uh, is also down, which should have been the one that should have been the rocket shot if the, you know, with the critical mineral plan and needing 388 new mines uh, around the world uh, to support the 2050 program. Um, so these things haven't really happened yet. Like the, there's been the talk, and everybody, I, you know, I think everybody right now that wanted an EV has got one, and now it's, now you know, people are buying an EV is just just a sort of a very simple binary decision. This is cheaper than the other one. Like it's not it's not a passion anymore. The guys that have the passion for these EVs, they got their vehicle. But you know, you got Ford lost one hundred and thirty two thousand dollars a unit for every every EV they sold this quarter. Uh, you got Rivian down five point four billion. So. There's going to be a clean up trade in the EV space and we get to the next leg of lithium and critical minerals. And then, uh, you know, I think the copper and gold are the clear winners right now. It doesn't matter which scenario you look at, copper is a winner. Um, with the central banks buying gold because of the threat of sanction out of the U.S. system right now is pretty widespread. I mean, the U.S. come out and said they're looking at sanctioning 
six to eight more Chinese banks for their participation with Russia. Uh, these central banks, they are they're, they're they're hedging away from the U.S. dollar system, uh, and you can you know if you take physical delivery of gold, um, it's hard for somebody to sanction you on the value of that. And you know Russian oil and gas is now trading mostly in gold, uh, and they're not taking you. They, you the Russia can't take U.S. dollars because they all get seized. So that you know this U.S. dollar trade is bifurcated at least once, and may do so again. Uh, and that's going to drive gold prices, and it's going to drive jurisdictional security, as we see. And, you know, finally, North America has woken up and decided that they don't have enough minerals uh, to support their energy transition. Uh, so the critical minerals business is sort of a variation on traditional on traditional metrics and themes. Um, you know, so it's it's a lot to try and digest, uh, I think. But the simple rule for me is copper and gold are going to be the winners, and everything else is a little more exotic. Right. Okay. And sorry, I did smile earlier because I think uh, you mentioned Unleash the Beast. I think Paul here is um, giving yeah. T-shirts away to his investors. Uh, That's right. <laughs> his, his, his quote from 2020. Um, so contact Paul directly. He'll be fine. Yeah, um, that you will, you're probably going to uh, reiterate, I suspect, a lot of those uh, sentiments on, on the uh, jurisdictional risk. Obviously, did you say you're unhedged in Western Australia? I can't, I can't remember. 100%, yeah. 100% unhedged. <laughs> you said it three times. <laughs> so, we'll say it again. Just so we're clear. Yeah. yeah, exactly. We can type it out on the screen too. In case yeah. everyone missed it. Uh, yeah. Right, so jurisdiction to you, obviously, that, that was the name of the game. In terms of m and it made a lot of sense to have someone, obviously, the proximity, but also the jurisdiction for, for you. What are, the other, some of, what are some of the other geopolitical considerations when you were looking around at what you should do? Because obviously, TXX company with Australian asset. You could have gone either way. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think I mean, basically you want to be in we I think our, the way that our group works. There's basically three countries that will be involved in: it's Canada, U.S., and Australia. That's that's where we want to play. That's where, for the most part, uh, you can understand legislation, you can understand regulatory impact. You know what what ministers and what groups say they're going to do. Broadly speaking, ends up happening. I mean, Western Australia is an unbelievable place to to permit a new mine. You get a surface to surface permit in 30 to 45 days. It's it's like nothing I've ever seen. So it's a great place to mine. Uh, um, and you know we're seeing some of the shift in the landscape in certain provinces and states in the U.S. But broadly speaking, uh, you know you can be more certain about what's happening there, which is great. When you start to step out in some of these other jurisdictions, and look, there's a lot of phenomenal projects all over the world. I mean, I always I perpetually tip my hand to Clive Johnson at B2 Gold, and the, the ability for him to navigate in a lot of these jurisdictions. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But I think there's few people that can do what that group does uh, in in a lot of the jurisdictions that they go into. So. Um, it's all about where you want to play and where your skill set is. Our skill set is, is being in tier one um, and, and you basically turning around assets that have been troubled, whether it's for a mining reason, whether it's for being undercapitalized or whether it's for something a little bit more complex, especially with the royalty structure that we saw in our assets in Australia. So that's where we see opportunities. That's what we get excited about. And that's where our skill set is. And that's what we've demonstrated in terms of success. And, and one thing I do want to circle back on, you know, when it comes to choosing your metals, I, I completely agree with Shaw when it comes to copper and gold in that ranking. I mean, copper is just a simple math problem. It's it's the most basic math problem out there. If we're going to achieve any of the energy reticulation goals that we have, and this doesn't have to be EV dependent whatsoever. You talk about the advent of AI and, and just the gargantuan amount of power that's needed for these power centers that are for these these uh, uh, operating centers. You know, you can't build a nuclear reactor next to every single one of these things, right? But no matter what, we need a lot more of this metal. Uh, and in order to get more metal out of this uh, out of the ground, it takes a very long time to get these projects online. You know, measured in ten to twenty years from from initial discovery, and we haven't had the discoveries that we need. So, copper is the clear winner. I think that's just uh, you know, you park your money in the best assets um, that you can find, the best teams you you, you can find. Be patient, and you will be rewarded. When it comes to gold, at least in my career, I have never seen an environment out of this. And I think the like this, and I think one of the most interesting things that I've seen so far this year in the first four, or I guess almost five months that we've seen this year is, you know, we used to be dominated by the lip service of the Fed. And look, the idea that the Fed's going to be cutting some rates, um, you know, that has dropped from expectations of over seven cuts earlier this year, which is hard to believe now to 1.4 times now. Uh, that moves all, all over the place, left, right, and center, right? And ultimately, they will have to cut. The question is just how much and when. But that's become irrelevant in the context of the geopolitical environment and uh, that, that Sean's highlighted. 
Chinese central bank buying, Chinese retail buying, Chinese, you know, domestically, China, people in China are living in a world where, you know, their housing market is collapsing. They, they're not allowed to access, and we won't go down this, this conversational thread. They're not allowed to access crypto. Um, and, and they have no trust in their own banking system, right? So they're buying retail, uh, or retail purchases of gold are, are absolutely unprecedented. And at the Shanghai exchange, where, which is the only exchange where you actually can collect physical delivery, you're starting to see a premium on physical delivery that is, is truly uh, enormous. So, um, that kind of driver, that structural driver is extremely positive for the gold price environment. You have uh, consi- you know, considerable unrest expanding across the world. And and you have uh, you know the backdrop of whatever's going to happen with the Fed. So gold price-wise, I think it's going to be wonderful. Let's get a few quarters notched here with these kind of margins, and the generalist capital will be, be unable to uh, to ignore this space. And one of the things that I've said on your on your you know your service here uh, several times before, the investable universe, you know, uh, Sean's talking about a lot of the big guys here um, relative to our sector. The investable universe in mining, let alone gold stocks, is a pimple on the back of, of the U.S. capital system, or let's just call it global capital pools. If and when, or I'd say when, not if, um, that capital decides to allocate, you know, 50 basis points of portfolios in some of these leveraged gold plays rather than just physical gold. It is a very, very violent uptick, and it's a fast, it's a fast, you know, fast capital flows, and it's fun to be a part of. So, pick your jockey, pick your horse, park your capital, have some patience, understand that at these margins, producers are able to survive, uh, and you know, enjoy those returns when they come. Do not try to be too cute. Don't try to wait till you know two weeks before you think Jerome Powell is going to say something or some piece of news is going to come out of the Middle East or China, and try to get your you know your three, four, five, ten bagger uh, weeks before it happens. Parking good assets, good teams, and be patient, and it's going to happen because the environment's here. We're in it now. Uh, it's just a matter of time. Great. Well, I think that's right, Fulsom. I've taken up a lot of your time today, but I hope there's some clues in there for investors in terms of people, assets, how you go about um, building businesses, and more importantly, having a look around the, the, the macro environment. So, corporate gold seems to be the, the, the tip of the day. Um, gentlemen, appreciate your time today, and we'll speak to you soon.